Hello, and thank you for clicking on this video. My name is Mike Florendo, and I'm a part of the leadership here at Redwood. I would like to personally invite you to come join us for a service. We pray that today's message will be a blessing. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe to stay up to date with the latest content. Thank you, and God bless. Well, good morning and welcome to Redwood. Let's all stand as we begin our worship service this morning as people make their way in. We're a little bit light here this morning on the uh, worship team, but it's going to be great. So uh, if halfway through the uh, message and throughout the service you want to jump on here, you're more than welcome to. Okay. So, But we're going to start off here by singing There Is a Name I Love to Hear. I love to sing His praise. Let's sing it out here this morning. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. And oh, how I love Jesus, and oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me And he tells me of a Savior's love Who died to set me free He tells me of his precious blood The sinner's perfect plea And oh, how I love Jesus and oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. It tells of one, it tells of one whose loving heart can fill my deepest woe, who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Let me hear you. And oh, how I love Jesus. And oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. If you love Jesus this morning, say amen. Amen. Well, praise the Lord for that song. Let's take a moment right now and ask God to bless our service. Father, we are so thankful, Lord, that you have loved us first. God, we are thankful that we did not have to do anything to gain your love, but that you are a good and gracious king, that you have extended your love toward us. And Lord, even in that while we were yet sinners, you still sent Jesus to die for us. What love. And Father, I pray that we would never get over that. But, God, but Lord, go deeper into that. And Father, we just thank you again for bringing us here this morning. We pray that you would bless our service. You would bless the worship. You would bless the preaching. You would bless the listener, the hearer this morning. And that, Lord, ultimately, as we leave here, God, that you would be honored and glorified. And that, God, we would be ready outside of these walls to share your gospel with those around us. Lord, I pray that you would make us bold witnesses of you. Lord, I pray that we would not be afraid to speak your name. We love you, Lord. We thank you. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's take a moment right now and greet someone around us.
Well, as you make your way back, we're going to continue to worship here this morning. We're going to sing here, You are my all in all. You are my strength when I am weak. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. In Jesus, Lamb of God, and worthy is your name. In Jesus, Lamb in my cross my shame rising again I bless your name you are my all in all when I fall down and when I fall down you pick me up when I am dry you fill my cup you are my all in all lift your voices in Jesus Lamb of God, and worthy is your name. In Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Again, in Jesus, Lamb God for that singing. You may be seated. Pastor. Take out a worship guide. We'll notice a few announcements here this morning and uh, thankful for each of you that are here and uh, it is good to be home for a quick stop for a Sunday and some of you have said, Pastor, why would you come home over a weekend uh, from your from your trip away and um, that is because I love, I love shepherding, I love Pastoring, I love bringing the word and teaching the word, and so it's a delight. It was a joy to fly in last night. Maybe the the delayed flight by about four hours wasn't so much so enjoyable, but being here with you is very enjoyable. Very excited to start our new series on the Beatitudes uh, here this morning, and um, so excited to be here. I will be flying out again this afternoon back to Denver. That's where my family is, and uh, we have hit several national parks, and we have many more to go. And so uh, next week, um, is going. Pastor Mike is going to be uh, bringing the word here at 11 o'clock and then JV at 10 o'clock. And then it's going to be Mike's birthday a few days after that. And so I want you all to make just show him your love. Show him how much you appreciate him. And I'm thankful for him and uh, as well as Jessica. So uh, next Sunday, make a big deal about it. Embarrass him. Do whatever you, know, you need to do to uh, make sure that he feels uh, loved. And uh, many of you have been praying for, uh, of course, Diane. This is, of course, Frank's spouse. And um, I have this uh, wonderful card um, from Diane. And she said, thank you so much, Pastor and Redwood, for your kind words and beautiful flowers. Very, very much appreciated. Love, Diane. And so even while away, was able to communicate with her. And they're still... Uh, planning things out, and so we will get you um, a memorial celebration uh, service as uh, soon as they kind of finalize some things. It's probably going to be even in, in a couple weeks, and so uh, please continue to uh, pray for them. And uh, I apologize, I'm going to have to leave pretty 
soon kind of after uh, a church. And so if I don't get a chance to uh, greet with you long after church, please uh, don't, don't take that personally. Uh, it's just that uh, I'm going to have to get up to the airport to get back with my family and to continue our uh, park trip, uh, national park trip. Marilyn, it is so good to see you here this morning. And it's been uh, a couple years and it's a joy uh, to see you. And then uh, please pray for, uh, pray for Matthew. Uh, this is Mona's son. Uh, they were, we, we met them last week, but he's uh, been, been extremely uh, just sick, got some things going on. And so if you think about it, I already prayed with her this morning, but uh, just uh, please uh, bring Matthew, that's her son, uh, before, uh, before the Lord. And so the doctors would know uh, exactly what was needed there. Well, the next thing that we've got on our calendar is our home group at the end of this month on May 27th. That's a Friday night, and uh, that will uh, start at 6.30. That always has dinner, and uh, then we will uh, break up. We're going to be starting a um, multiple um, home group all through May and as well as June on just some some topics on creation. We're studying why the Generation Z is leaving the faith at a clip like no other generation. And so just dig deep into uh, the, the just creation. I'm going to stay in my lane. I'm not a scientist. I've mentioned that over the last couple uh, times I've announced this. But it will be, I will give you tools that you can use to talk with this next generation. And so please uh, be prepared for that. And then you can see the other announcement here is on June 5th, we're going to have a special uh, Lord's Table and Fellowship uh, service. And uh, so we'll have our 11 o'clock and then we will have a picnic lunch for those that want to stay uh, for that. And then we will come back in here for a um, for a special observance of the Lord's Table. And so I'm looking, I'm looking forward to that. Mike, come lead us in a few more songs, please. Let's stand and continue to worship the Lord this morning. Let's sing here, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and oh my soul, worship His holy name, and sing like name. No, my soul, I worship your holy name. The sun comes up. The sun comes up. It's a new day dawning. And it's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be seen when the evening comes. Sing it out here, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and oh my soul, and worship Him. Holy name, sing like never before. And oh, my soul, and I worship your holy name. You're rich in love, you're rich in love, and your soul to Your heart is kind For all your goodness I will keep on singing Ten thousand Ten thousand reasons For my heart to find Lift up your voice and sing it Bless the Lord Bless the Lord Oh my soul And oh and worship His holy name and sing like never before and oh my soul and I'll worship Your holy name and on that day and on that day when my strength is failing, and the 
end draws near and my time has come and still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years and now forevermore let me hear you sing it out this morning bless the lord oh my soul singing that part in the, at the third verse of um, and one day when our strength is failing you think about Frank and you know he's in heaven right now singing like he's never done before um, and man how true is that going to be one day when we all get to see Jesus and um, if you know Frank and if you ever talked to him brother Vince and I were talking about him today this morning that whenever he would talk to you he always started tearing up and you could just tell for all the many years that he's lived and loved Jesus that that was real. And he's, and he's sung like never before. And he's doing it now in heaven. So just that great promise. Amen. That pr- promise that we get to, man, sing now today and then sing like we've never done before later. But let's continue here and sing how good God is. God, you're so good. Amazing love. Amazing love that welcomes me, the kindness of mercy that bought with blood wholeheartedly my soul undeserving. You're so good in God. You're so good in my God. You're so good. You're so good to me. Behold and behold the cross. dead are raised and the sinner saved the work of your power lift it up and claim it in God you're so good yes he is in God you're so good in my God you're so so good to me. I am blessed, I am called, I am healed, I am whole, I am saved in Jesus' name. Highly favored, anointed, filled with your power for the glory of Jesus. Name again. I am blessed, I am called, I am healed, I am whole, I am saved in Jesus' 
promises of that cross and the promises of the resurrection and that whenever you're going through suffering and I promise you, you will, it's the Christian life. But you look back to Calvary, you look back to the empty tomb and you look at that and you claim back the promises both now and forever. This world is not our home. We're just passing through. Just take a moment right now and just praise God in prayer this morning that he is so good. Can we pray all this in Jesus' name? Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. Jessica, thank you for playing. I enjoyed the acoustic session uh, here this morning. And pray for the Florendos there. I believe they're all sick, all of them. That's brutal when the entire household, when everyone from the adult all the way down to the kiddos uh, are sick. And then others are sick as well. And so please be in prayer for them. Matthew chapter number 5. Matthew 5. Let me ask you a question. How many of you loved Psalm 23? Say amen. amen. Yeah, me too. In about 18, 20 weeks or so, I'm going to ask you, how many of you love the Beatitudes? And we might say, oh me. Right? So buckle your seatbelt. It's not Psalm 23, okay? And, uh, but I believe the Lord will uh, indeed meet with us. Um, I've entitled the series, and this is going to be a overview of uh, the series here this morning, and that is the Beatitudes, the kingdom is ours. Beatitudes, the kingdom is ours. And uh, Jesus for sure is, when he's preaching in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, it is very much has a, has a kingdom mindset to it. And uh, a lot of it's going to uh, take place, you know, in, in heaven. But in Christ, it can be now. What can go, what what well, what can happen in our lives? Um, all these beatitudes is really ours in Christ. And my prayer is that we would lean into them. We'd allow them the the, the weight of Scripture to uh, kind of press down on us uh, and to grow from it. Matthew chapter five. Uh, beginning in verse number one, and seeing the multitude, he went up to a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, blessed, or blessed, it's kind of an interchangeable term, blessed, blessed, that's what I've entitled our time this morning, blessed. Over the last several weeks, really the last probably two months, I have immersed myself in these words of Jesus, and they've had a very profound effect upon my life in uh, at least three different ways. I found the Beatitudes very compelling because Jesus speaks about a life that is blessed by God. Who would not want to listen to Jesus when he's talking about where blessings flow and how how he shows us the path in which blessings can be found? I believe everyone wants to be blessed. We want to be blessed in life 
And we also want to be blessed in death. We want to be blessed in ultimately eternity. Well, the opposite of being blessed would, of course, be cursed. And nobody wants that. But here's the Son of God speaking about a life that is blessed and people that are blessed. And that leads me to say, I want to be one of those people. I want to be one of those families. I want to, I want to be one of, those, well, one of those churches, maybe, when we speak of a collective whole. I want that. I want to take a, a fresh look at myself. And I want to be sure that I am pursuing a life that Jesus says is blessed. See, now the Beatitudes, they do more than just describe a blessed life. They actually give us the means by which we can pursue it. And I want to show you from these words of Jesus how you can, don't get scared of this word, how you can make progress before the message is over. You'll understand why I use that word progress, but why you can make progress in your Christian life. See, if you are a follower of Christ, you probably know that sometimes you feel stuck. Sometimes you get into a rut. And we see here that sometimes, even in the Christian life, that, that, that God can, can use his word, and you can use some ancient words of Jesus, some 2,000 years old or so, in, to help you to progress in this life, to grow, to become, to become more like Christ. But we all know that there's times when we lose momentum. There's times when we get into a rut. There's times when we get stuck. Now, you may not believe that a person's heart can kind of pump faster, but I assure you, the last couple of weeks, my heart's been pumping faster uh, because of, of just studying this text. My heart's also been pumping a little bit faster because we've been doing these hikes at like altitudes of like six, seven, and eight thousand. I'm like, what is wrong with me? Am I really this out of shape? And thinking, oh, we live at like zero here, and this is like thousands up. But no, in preparation for this study, the weeks prior, I'm just, I, I've been just saturating myself with these B attitudes and the progress, if you allow me to use that word again, in the Christian life. So I, I find them compelling. Jesus is like, here's a blessed life. But I also have found the Beatitudes searching. Jesus describes who is this blessed individual. And that ultimately begs the question, is he describing me? Is he describing my life? Am I displaying more of the marks of a person who is blessed? What matters is, is, what matters is not that I say I am blessed, but that God pronounces me blessed. And we understand that that blessing is wholly found in Jesus Christ, but there's practicality to that, and that's what this series is all about. Jesus describes those who are blessed, and so I searched, and hey, God, does this, does this text uh, describe me? But then also, the third kind of takeaway as I've been studying these for the last uh, several weeks is that it's led me to worship. See, what you hear in the words of Jesus, you will also see in the life of Jesus. There is total integrity in the Son of God. Christ practices what he preaches, right? We always want, hey, if, if the, whoever's preaching, I wish he would practice what he preached. We're all guilty of that, absolutely. If we only could preach what we practice, this would be a much thinner book, right? But Jesus is a man of integrity. He is the Son of God, and he practices what he preached. Meditating on these beatitudes is leading me to worship because worship happens as we glimpse the glory of of the Son of God. This morning's message, as I've already said, is an introduction to the series. I want us to become more familiar with these Beatitudes and for us to learn how to use them. I see this teaching and the question is, okay, so how do I, how do I apply this? This is great teaching, ancient teaching from Jesus Christ, but, but how, does, how does Ryan apply it in his life in 2022? How do I use it? How do I put it to work? in my life. 
Well, you can use the Beatitudes as a tool for discernment, a key to progress, and a window into worship. But I want to start this morning with a tool for discernment. I want you to think with me for a moment. I've been in nature for the last for the last week. We left last Sunday uh, for our trip. We left a day early just because some snow was coming in. And we still hit snow on the Donner Pass in Lake Tahoe. If you've ever been in a minivan with a family in there and loaded down with, you know, literally two weeks worth of stuff, and then a snowstorm hits and you got to go down Donner Pass, if you've been there, hey, let's get coffee sometime because we could tell the stories. It's great. No, it wasn't great. It was terrifying. But we've been to all different places and we've seen all different kinds of things. And so I want to ask you a question here. If you were to maybe go bird watching, we've seen all kinds of birds in the different locations we've been. And imagine yourself picking up a pair of binoculars and then you set out looking to spot a few, yeah, birds. You look towards the trees and you see an American goldfinch. Nick, can you put that picture up there? Oh, that's a pretty bird. No, I did not take that picture. That's a Google picture, all right? But how do you know that that's an American goldfinch? You know it by its distinctive yellow color. So if you decided that you're going to go away from maybe looking into the trees and you were to walk along a river and you were to see a spotted sandpiper, you bring that picture up. How do you know that it's a spotted sandpiper? A spotted sandpiper. How do you know that? Well, by its spots, right? all over its belly. The point here is a very simple one. Birds are known by their distinguishing marks. Hey, Nick, I'm going to go to the red mark. So we'll see if that'll work a little bit better. Does that sound a little bit better too? It's not cutting in and out? Good. All right. So, So birds are known by distinguishing marks. That's how you can tell one breed from another. And I don't know all the different breeds of birds and nor would I even claim to. But what are the distinguishing marks of a Christian? How would you this morning describe to me, if you were were asked to, to describe what are the spots of a Christian? How can you actually spot a Christian? Or maybe you can put it a little bit more personally. How can I know that I am a real Christian? What are the distinguishing marks of a true child of God? Well, someone this morning might say, well, I know of a true Christian by what they believe. And that would be a great, great answer. Because God has revealed many, many truths in his word and what we ought to believe as far as to be a Christian. John 8, 24 says, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am he, you will die in your sins. And so Jesus is connecting being saved from your sin is believing in Jesus Christ. Jesus also answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he hath sent. So that you believe in Jesus Christ. And certainly there are other beliefs as well. But you cannot believe that. If you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you cannot be a Christian. But James reminds us in James chapter number 2 that even the devil believes in Jesus. Even the devil believes in God. Satan knows that Jesus Christ died for sin. Satan knows that Christ rose from the dead. There's no doubt about it, and he doesn't have a doubt about it. It is an undeniably true fact, even in hell itself. Belief. So how do you know a person is a real Christian? Well, someone might say, well, I know a person is a Christian by what they do. It's not just about what they say, because, you know, anyone can say that they're a Christian, but it's about, you know, does their life back up what they say? And again, very, very good answer, because you cannot be a Christian apart from that. Jesus said in Matthew 7, therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will like him, liken him unto a wise man, which build his house upon a rock. 
Yet Jesus himself tells us that there will be people to whom he is going to say in the last day, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. So not only is it what we say, but it's what we do. But verse 22 says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. These are some of the most sobering words in all of Scripture. These were individuals that did great things. They said, Lord, Lord, so they, so, 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 so they, they believed, so to speak, in him, they, and they did great things, but they were not true Christians. They're going to say, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do these mighty works in your name? These are pretty impressive works. They regarded themselves as Christians, but Jesus is making it clear and preaching a sermon about Jesus or even bringing deliverance to other people in the name of Jesus is not in and of itself conclusive evidence that a person is truly a Christian. So here's what that means for me. On the last day, I can't come to the Lord and I can't say, hey, Lord, I pastored a church in the Bay Area of all places. The Bay Area. God, I mean, don't you, don't you know what I was trying to do in the Bay Area? There would be no value whatsoever in coming to God with that. Why? Because that's not what he's looking for. Blessing is not found through having a position in ministry. So where does blessing lie? Look at verse number 3 of Matthew 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. See, Jesus, he doesn't begin with this great doctrinal bib- doctrines of the Bible. He does not begin by saying, hey, let's get you somehow involved in ministry. He begins by saying, let me tell you what a person who lives under the blessing of God looks like. And as I read these Beatitudes over and over and over again, I had to ask myself, are these the things that I am pursuing? Ryan, forget that you have uh, been, uh, that you're a pastor. Forget about the fact that you've been saved for 30 years now. What evidence is there that you live under this blessing? that you live under this rule. It's searching in my life. And I invite you over weeks. There's only eight Beatitudes, but we're going to spend multiple weeks, sometimes even in each one of them. But I invite you to open up yourself with me even this morning, as an introductory message to the gaze of Jesus Christ on you and on your life. Blessed are the peacemakers. Am I a person that brings peace? Does peace follow me because it lives in me? Who is peace? Jesus is peace. But does it follow me Does the evidence show that I have peace within me? Or do people in my home or in the workplace experience tension from me because of the turmoil that is inside of me? Blessed are the pure in heart. What's the condition of my heart? To the extent of uh, of my heart, is is it pure? To what extent is it marked by impurity. Blessed are the merciful, Jesus said. How am I doing it when it comes to the business of forgiving others? Do I forgive quickly? Am I merciful towards others' weaknesses and failings? Or do I point it out? Merciful. Blessed are those who hunger and are thirsty for righteousness, Jesus says. Does that describe me today? Does that describe you today? 
If I go a day without food, but by the evening I am starving, right? I mean, unless it's for some, you know, spiritual purpose where you're fasting and giving up food or giving up something else. I mean, if I just, if I go and I leave the home early and I don't get breakfast, I don't get lunch, by nighttime I'm ready for dinner. I'm ready to go. Whatever it is, I don't care what it is, chicken nachos, whatever it is, Richard, I am ready to eat. Is that how I am spiritually Is that how I am with God? Is that how I am with his word and with praying? Do I hunger and do I thirst after righteousness? Do I want to do what is right no matter the cost? See, when Jesus describes who is blessed, is he describing you? Would someone spot these marks in me is what I've been asking for multiple weeks. So I want you to ask yourself this question. Am I consciously submitting myself to the will of God? Am I mourning over my sin so that I begin to hate what I used to love and to despise what I used to choose? Or am I remaining pretty much the same with the habitual sins in my life and I'm not really ever changing do I recognize that when I, when I have done all, I have nothing to offer God, and I hang on to the mercy of Christ <clears throat> as an undeserving sinner? Now, before we go any further, i got to pause, and i got to make one thing very, very, very clear for us. The Beatitudes are not telling you how to become a Christian. That is not what Jesus is teaching here. They are telling us what a true Christian looks like. The message is not if you humble yourself, if you mourn over your sins, if you submit with meekness to God's plan and you get an appetite for righteousness, this will all of a sudden produce everlasting life in you. That's not at all what Jesus is saying. That would be salvation by works. And that is not what the Bible teaches. It's not what Jesus is teaching here. So here is the message. Many people profess to be Christians. Oh, it's easy to say it. The church at its best, talking about in general, church in general, at its best is a mixed bag of genuine, genuine converted Christians and those that just think they are. Those that have just bought maybe a simplistic lie and just said, hey, I am a believer. So we need to examine ourselves if we see if we are truly a Christian. The evidence that you are a Christian, the unfakeable marks are that you humble yourself before God, that you mourn over your sins and do not skip over them lightly, that you submit yourself meekly to God, and that you have an appetite for righteousness. And others, right? Thomas Watson, excuse me, in his book, The Beatitudes, says, if we do not imitate his life, We cannot be saved by his death. Watson is not saying that we are saved by imitating the life of Christ. He's quite clear that we are saved by the blood of Christ or by the death of Jesus Christ. So the question is, who is saved by the death of Christ? How do we know who has been saved by the death of Christ? Well, the answer is, is those who seek to imitate his life. That's what Watson is saying. Watson isn't saying, hey, hey, you work your way, be, be just like Jesus, and you'll get heaven. No, 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 Jesus had to die for you to have heaven. But true Christians are going to do their best to imitate that life of Christ. Are you going to be perfect? No. And I, 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 I'm already, I, I'm getting ahead of myself. I love this message. <laughs> so as we work through this series, it may be that you will come to the conclusion that you're not yet a Christian and you need to become one. And that will be a, a glorious day for you. It's not a day where you've got to shrink back and be like, oh, I've, I, I thought I was saved for all these years. Redwoods thought I was saved. Pastor Ryan thought I was saved. Listen, if you're not and you get saved, we will rejoice with you. Amen, church? Oh, don't let Satan lie to you. Oh, I've got to keep this thing a secret. Don't keep that a secret and go to hell. Open up and say, I've never trusted Christ as my Savior. Today's the day. I don't have any of this in my life. It's proof that I'm not a believer, and I'm going to trust Christ today. Oh, we will rejoice with you. We won't be like, well, you've been in this church for three years. What's your problem? No, that's what Satan tells you, to keep it. Take this to the grave. No, no. So if that's you, that's great. But my prayer 
is for each of us that claim to be a believer, and I have no reason to believe that you're not, is that we would grow in this, that we would progress in this. So it's a tool for discernment, just as those pictures of those birds were a tool for, how do you, how do you know the difference? Well, this is a, a tool for discernment, but let me say secondly, it is a key to progress. There's a definitive order in the Beatitudes. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't see it until a couple years ago when I was planning to prepare for this. Each of these virtues flows from the one before it. There is an order. There is a progress. There is a development. And my prayer is that a couple months from now, if you're, if you're, if you're not here, make sure that you catch our YouTube so that way, you can, that way you can stay up with it. But that in a couple months from now, we can see the progress in these Beatitudes. It starts with roots. The first three be- Beatitudes deal with our need. We are poor in spirit because we see our inability to live as God commands. We mourn because our sins are many. We become meek rather than self-willed and defiant because we do not have the ability to direct our lives wisely. These three are the roots of a godly life. And what comes out of the roots? Life. A plant trees, the roots, all of a sudden you begin to see the springing of life. This, you kind of, the sense of need comes to a deep longing for what we do not have. It is a hunger and it is a thirst for righteousness. It is a desire to be like Christ. I'm calling this the life of godliness. You've got, you've got the root will spring up to a life of godliness. And what comes from life? Fruit. Fruit. This life of hungering and thirsting for the righteousness that is found in Christ and only in Christ produces beautiful fruit. Mercy, purity of heart, and peace. Roots, life, fruits. Roots, life, fruits. Say it with me. Roots, life, fruits. Let's do it again because I didn't hear anybody but myself, okay? Roots, Life fruits. That, my friend, is the progression in this text. You can't get to the fruit without cultivating the root. Why can't I forgive, Ryan? You can't, you you just can't try harder to forgive. You must start with the root that produces the life, this hunger to want that fruit in your life. You will notice that there's also an eighth beatitude, which reminds us that the person who pursues this godly life, that pursues this type of fruit, will not only be blessed by God, but will be persecuted by the world. And we'll we'll talk about that when we get there. Now, seeing that there is a distinct pattern of progress in the beatitudes, but I I want to go a step further. And I want to suggest to you that each of these Beatitudes flows from the one that went before it. There is an image that I want in your mind over the next couple months. And I want to start it here with this series. Imagine a child at the playground swinging from one ring to the next on monkey rings. Can you bring that picture up, Nick? How many of you have ever been on monkey rings before, right? All right. And you know how these how these work. Again, that's not my family. It's not my daughter. That's a Google family. That's a Google pick. Those are great, right? But monkey rings. I want you to, I want you to think about monkey rings over the course of this series. See, the key to swinging on monkey rings is what? Momentum. That's the key. The momentum of your swing on the first ring makes it possible to get to the second ring. And then your momentum on the second ring makes it possible to get to the third and so on and so forth. 
Without your momentum from the previous swing, the next ring would always be beyond your reach. So if you can't remember maybe all the way back when you were a kid, those of you that do have children, maybe you've seen them do this. When they're really, really young and they're trying and you're teaching them, you just gotta have, you just got to swing out there. And if they don't have enough momentum and they can't get to it, then obviously they'll come back and, it, and, and they won't be able to reach the next ring. The Beatitudes. This is what I want you to get. It is like... A series of rings. You move to the next one with the momentum that you have gained from the last. I'll be honest with you, I am finding this profoundly helpful in my very own life. Someone says, Pastor, I can't forgive. I want to. I want to, but but it's it's beyond me. I just can't get there. How do I how do I get to the place of forgiveness? Another person says, Pastor, there's so much impurity in my heart. I hate it. I want to get rid of it. But I don't know how to. How do I, how do I get a pure heart? This is a deeply felt question for many. How do you get to the fifth or the sixth beatitude? You start with the beginning. And everyone in here can do this. Because the first ring is to recognize that you do not have what it takes in yourself. Blessed, blessed, however you want to say it, is the poor in spirit. Can you imagine how sunk we would all be if the first beatitude was blessed are the pure in heart? We'd all say, I can't do that. (laughs) There's no way. Blessing begins when you realize that you do not have what it takes in and of yourself. But all of you can reach that today and tomorrow and later this afternoon when you blow it, whatever, when you're struggling to forgive that person, whatever the, whatever the case is, God, in and of myself, I cannot do this, but I have Christ in me. Boom, you're on the first one. And you're starting to get some momentum. You mess up. Oh, I, I, Lord, I, I can't do this in my own strength. I, I, I've, I've got to acknowledge you. You're right at the first one again. Swinging, getting the momentum. Swing on the first ring and you'll be soon find that repentance comes within your reach. Beatitude number two. You will find that you begin to hate what you used to love and despise what you used to choose. As you mourn over your sin, seeing its effects in your life and on the lives of others around you, you will begin to hate the self-will that says, God may not want this, but it's what I want, and so I'm going to do it anyways. And as you hate the self-will, you will find the meekness that submits to God's will for your life. And it's coming within grasp. This is how the Holy Spirit works in the transformation of a Christian's life. Progression. But what happens if you lose momentum? Hey, Nick, go back to that uh, picture of the rings, please. So this young girl here, she's going. But what happens if she, what happens if she mix, misses that next ring? And then she comes back. Well, she'll have lost momentum, and then she won't be able to get it. Ultimately, then they end up stopping, and then no one can just stay there for very long. And so what do they do? They just drop. You know how many Christians drop out? Because they don't see that this is in Christ. And that you always come back to the beginning. You know what you do? You preach the gospel to yourself. You go back to the beginning and it's like, God, I can't do this apart from you. But in you, I'm poor in spirit. I can't do this. But God, you can. That's a good picture of something that often happens in our Christian lives. And my prayer is that, that, we, will, that we will think through this as we get into we get into these texts and we start breaking them down and then we go further into the New Testament and bring practicality to it uh, in our lives that we would say, okay, no, 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 this isn't, this isn't a backpack for me. Oh, I, I, I can't forgive. I can't forgive. No, you'd go all the way back to the beginning and then you'd get the progression, the momentum that God has for you. This is of huge importance. How can I have purity of heart? How can I forgive the person who has hurt me? How can I become a person who brings peace instead of turmoil? You can start from where you are. You can't, excuse me, start from where you are. You have to start at the, back, at the front. This is not something that you can do once. 
This is how you live in the Christian life every single day. Every day you set out saying, I want to pursue purity of heart. I want to be a person who forgives. I want to bring peace where there is trouble. And Lord, I have to say to you today, I do not have what it takes within me all on my own to do this. I have got to have the power, the resurrected power that I have in Jesus Christ to begin to do this in my life. And boom, you're on your path of momentum. And that leads me finally here. Let me just close with this. A window to worship. It's a tool for discernment. How do, we, how do we know what a true Christian is? They've been bought through the blood of Jesus Christ, and now they're trying to emulate who Christ is. The key to progress, and we're going to see this week in and week out, but then it leads me to a window to worship. Looking at Jesus will give you a fresh vision of the glory of Jesus. As I said at the beginning, everything that Christ says, he does. Jesus is the blessed one. I want you to see him. See him. Leaving the riches of heaven. Embracing our poverty. Humbling himself even to the death of the cross, Paul tells us in Ephesians 2. So Jesus is saying, hey, hey, the blessed one is a humble one, a poor in spirit, humble in spirit. And see Jesus, who was the humble one. See him as he mourns over the sins of Jerusalem. Jesus comes up before Jerusalem and he says, I would have as like a mother hen, I would have brought you in, but ye would not. And he mourns the sin of Jerusalem. He wasn't mourning his own sin because he was sinless. He was tempted at all points like as we are, yet without sin. But he mourned the sins of Jerusalem. See him in the Garden of Gethsemane as he meekly submits himself to the will of the Father. He says, God, I, I, don't want, I don't want to drink this cup. God, if you somehow can allow this to pass, nevertheless, at thy word, I will, I'll drink this cup. I will follow your path for me. I will be meek. I will allow you to bring me to this even at its unbelievable cost do you still think that meekness is weakness when you connect it to Jesus oh our world thinks meekness is weakness no it's sheer power for him to say not my will but thine you know how often our will wins because we have no power We're not using the power that we've got we just allow our flesh and our own will to do it you know what real power is I'm going to suppress what I want to do and God, I'm going to allow you and your will to lead me and to guide me. Jesus is the perfect example of this. See him drawing near to you today in his awesome purity and yet with grace and mercy and forgiveness to bring you peace with God. Aren't you glad blessed are the poor in heart is not the first beatitude? And if it was, we'd all be saying, I can't reach that ring. I can't reach it. Thank God the place to begin is not with the purity of heart or with becoming a forgiving person, but with realizing that I don't have what it takes apart from Christ in me. And that's where we can start every moment of every single day. And that's why I tell you, my friends, the kingdom is ours. It's not something that you have to attain. You don't have to get to the end. You've got it right now in Jesus. So let's begin to progress. That's what this series will be about. Actually having heaven on earth. Blessed are the poor in spirit. All of us can start there. You can get on that ring. Recognize our great need. Coming to our Savior. You could do that today. You can do that every day. It's yours. And the last.
allow God to bring progression. We're going to go over it in our lives. I can't forgive, Ryan. Go back to the beginning, and you'll see your lack of forgiveness. Secondly, is a sin. All right, I'm going to submit to your will. You want me to forgive. You see that? Roots. I want a spiritual life. I want to, I want to grow. I want to hunger. I want to thirst after Jesus. And then the peace and the mercy comes to follow. Every head bowed, every eye closed.